going to jump into our next presentation. So, so our, our kind of introductory speakers kind of frame this as far as logistically what the issues are for the agencies and so forth. Um, our next speaker, uh, Clinton Campbell, is from USDA APHIS and, and is really going to put this in more practical, you know, what the real challenges are. And, and every time he gives this talk, I learn something new and, and awe-inspiring on the, the insurmountable jobs that, that, that these agencies have to try and protect us from, from uh, species as they come in across the border. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Clinton Campbell from the USDA APHIS uh, program to talk about the pathways of species invasion. Well, good morning. Uh, yes, I'm uh, Clinton Campbell with the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine, which is quite a lot to say. And uh, I'm in uh, the Washington and Alaska office, uh, located in Federal Way, Washington. Therefore, it's appropriate that I'm standing on the edge of Washington State with an Alaska State Ferry in the background. And even if it hadn't been there, I have my Alaska hat on. I'm going to talk about pathways of uh, species invasion. And uh, one of the key things will be uh, some of the unusual circumstances we've encountered in the past that have helped shape at least my thinking of pathways. I'm going to talk about a number of topics, so what, what I call three factors, anything that moves, atypical pathways, case studies, regulated garbage, question mark, and other examples. First, a familiar example, uh, especially to those who are engaged in plant pathology, you have the uh, plant disease triangle, where essentially you need three things to bring about a plant disease, the pathogen, the host, and a favorable environment. I tend to think of invasive species introduction potential in largely the same way. When risk assessments and other things are done, there are numerous things that USDA and other agencies look at in evaluating the potential for certain organisms to come into the country. But typically I've boiled them down to about three things. Um, climate, the host or resource available, and of course, very importantly, a pathway. Is there a way for the thing to even get here in the first place? And so today my objective is to have us take another slightly different look at pathways. And specifically the message is this. Anything that moves can move an invasive species. It's really as simple as that. Um, when USDA does a lot of its risk assessment for you know, various commodities coming into the United States and so on, usually fruits and vegetables and other things, of course, that have greater potential for bringing in live plant pests, again, there are lots of things that we look at. And we, we can examine things up one side and down the other, and that, that's fine. But from a daily perspective, you know, as a regular person and so on, whatever you're involved with, the, the way that maybe we can start thinking about invasive species and the movement of them is just think about the fact that anything that moves can bring them in. And so when you have that in mind, you know, you can think about, okay, maybe there's something I should do about this before I move it. Should I inspect it? Should I take some sort of measure to mitigate any potential problem that I may or may not be aware of, that kind of a thing. And part of what's driven this, at least in my experience, has been uh, what I call atypical pathways. And again, many pathways are known, usually thought to be understood, but certain of these atypical pathways have you know, demonstrated that weird stuff happens and that we need to think along the lines of anything that moves when it comes to invasive species and the ability to bring them in. So I have a couple case studies, one involving gypsy moth and one involving the citrus longhorn beetle. The gypsy moth, as many of you are aware, uh, comes in a couple different forms. The European gypsy moth, 
which has been in Eastern U United States and Canada for decades, since the late 1800s. But it also has an Asian form, which has certain different characteristics, which make it a little more serious a pest. And it has shown up on the West Coast a number of times, starting in the early 1990s. And uh, anyway, both have been a large uh, concern for both countries, Canada and the United States, for, again, decades. And there's been uh, active programs available due to the advent of good traps and good lures for gypsy moth for at least the last 40 years. And here's a picture here of the male uh, gypsy moth and the female. And the, the difference between uh, the European and the Asian form of gypsy moth is the female, although it has wings, does not fly, cannot fly. Whereas the Asian form of gypsy moth, the female is flight capable. And that's what can allow it to spread very fast if it comes into an area. Now the typical pathway for European gypsy moth, the one that's found in the eastern part of North America, uh, at least for our purposes out here in the West, is what we call outdoor household articles or OHAs. And they can be the kinds of things you see there on the screen, outdoor furniture, firewood. We've had a number of cases in the state of Washington where people have brought their birdhouse with them. And inside the birdhouse are gypsy moth egg masses, it's later determined. Uh, even fancy cars or not so fancy cars have been found to have uh, gypsy moth egg masses on them. They don't even have to be cars that somebody is driving. In Alaska, we've had situations where gypsy moth uh, has been trapped even up around Fairbanks, Alaska, usually in RV type of situations because somebody has driven the Alaska Highway from, let's say, somewhere back east, brought some gypsy moth eggs with them inadvertently, Next thing you know, you end up catching a, a moth. So that's the typical way that something like gypsy moth has come into this part of the country. But in 1991, we had a little different situation and kind of an awakening. Uh, when the Soviet Union fell, some of the ports that were in Eastern Russia began working as commercial ports. They'd previously been military ports. And of course, a lot of that area is forested and so on, and so they were you know, either bringing logs or probably more like just bringing ships, really, to come get logs or whatever the case may be. But in any case, you had a new pathway open, and uh, some of the very first introductions of Asian gypsy moth were on very large ships that were, you know, coming into Puget Sound or otherwise, and it's believed that some of the larvae were hatching from eggs and uh, doing what we call ballooning off of the ships, where they throw out a silk line, the wind catches it, and away they go end up in the forest or otherwise. And so that was how things were handled during the 1990s, that kind of a pathway. But uh, later on, toward the end of that decade, we had a rather uh, unusual situation, as I say at the bottom of this slide, in 1999, involving the U.S. Marshal, a uh, couple of Russian fishing ships, and it resulted in some real fireworks because what happened then was even though it was a Russian ship, it did get inspected after it had been seized by the U.S. Marshal off of Port Angeles and brought into the Seattle area. It was docked in an area that wouldn't normally be, you know, used by the commercial ships or anything like that. And it was inspected and found to have some gypsy moth egg masses. USDA even went so far as to try to have it tarped and fumigated, which I wasn't there, but I've been told that the tarps were flapping in the wind and the fumigation was not exactly working very well. So anyway, the state of Washington very wisely put out extra traps, ended up catching a male Asian gypsy moth a half mile from where this ship was brought in. You can kind of see the likelihood of what actually happened. So in this case, you had a, a pathway that nobody would have expected, a Russian fishing ship you know, brought in under a seizure, and it ends up having a situation where I can guarantee you spraying the part of Seattle that we had to spray was not exactly popular. And uh, these things just happen. And this was the particular ship. I don't know if it's still around. Here's another example though of, of atypical stuff. As I mentioned earlier, ports and so on on the West Coast had been found as you know places where Asian gypsy moth was coming in. In 2004, a place in the Idaho Panhandle, Hauser, Idaho, just 
basically as you cross the Washington border into Idaho, they trapped an Asian gypsy moth there in some little area which probably had a railroad track and a road. And, uh, you know, that had to be dealt with. But again, it was a place where nobody would have expected to find Asian gypsy moth based on everything that had happened previously for the last decade. And it shows you that these unusual situations, whatever it was that brought it there, something moved it there. And that's, that's really the key. And therefore, that's why, you know, if transportation uh, conveyances and so on can always be thought of as moving something, uh, it's all the better to be able to look at that kind of stuff and make sure that you're not moving an invasive species. Uh, moving a little ahead in time now, uh, we had a situation just a few years ago where there was a very large outbreak of uh, Asian gypsy moth, again, in eastern Russia. And there was a, a town called Nahadka, which apparently the reason that a lot of ships were stopping there is because it was it had lower fuel prices. So they were stopping there, getting fuel, and oh, by the way, as you see in the picture, there were a lot of Asian gypsy moths everywhere at the time. So of course, these Asian gypsy moths were doing what they do, you know, flying to the ships because the ships are at ports where there's lots of lights, the moths are drawn in from the forest, and so on. And these particular, some of these particular ships were carrying steel slabs. That's what's in the picture here. And these are, you know, the size of a bus or two buses, uh, just gigantic things. And in the port of Vancouver, Washington, the Customs and Border Protection people who inspect stuff coming in off of ships began to find gypsy moth egg masses on and underneath these steel slabs from Russia. Again, this is something that had never happened before. Nobody had even really thought about this particular pathway. But you see, you had an unusual set of circumstances. Ships going to an unusual place because fuel's cheap, then they come over here, what they're carrying has got something a little out of the ordinary, and it turns out it too has Asian gypsy moth egg masses. So they ended up fumigating a lot of these steel slabs and going to great trouble to try to deal with this. Now, not surprisingly, in 2015, we, we caught Asian gypsy moth in Vancouver, Washington, and Portland, Oregon caught an Asian gypsy moth or two as well. You can probably see where the likely uh, source of that was. And again, in this particular picture here, it's just showing the Asian gypsy moth egg mass. And you can appreciate how difficult these things are to find, even if uh, they're not on a ship. The customs people, some of them are fantastic at looking for this kind of stuff, but it's, it's really needle in the haystack stuff at best. Very difficult work. Moving to another case example, uh, you probably have heard of Asian longhorn beetle. And it uh, has been found in a number of states back east. And the culprit there was what they call solid wood packing material, which can be, you know, beams and pallets and other things, a lot of which are used apparently in ships to stabilize cargo, that kind of stuff. Apparently, back when, a lot of the material that was coming from Asia to do this kind of stabilization was, you know, wood that wasn't exactly high quality. It was cheap wood. That's why they were using it. And oh, by the way, it had pests in it, which weren't fully appreciated at the time. So in any case, it ended up uh, getting back east. Probably they believed through uh, uh, solid wood packing material, bringing in, you know, steel pipe and things like that. So a relative of Asian longhorn beetle, almost a lookalike, called citrus bee longhorn beetle also exists, as do many other similar beetles of this sort. We had a couple instances in 2001 in the state of Washington where all of a sudden a new but related beetle showed up and boy did it have an unusual pathway. Uh, in this case it, were, it was bonsai maple trees from Korea that were brought in and under USDA uh, requirements were held in what we call post-entry quarantine. Basically that means that these kinds of materials have to be kept, you know, like in a screen house or otherwise for a couple growing seasons to watch and monitor them to make sure there isn't some sort of a problem. Now, typically, post-entry quarantine had to do with plant diseases. It really wasn't so much focused on insects, and it wasn't really appreciated up until about this time that, oh, dwarfed material, dwarf plant material could also be a source of certain 
rather major league pests and so on. And we had a situation, actually two in the state of Washington, but one especially in Tuckwillow, Washington, where plants in this greenhouse shown, or right outside this greenhouse shown, uh, were being kept under post-entry quarantine. The owner noticed some beetles climbing around on them. People got called, and then people saw beetles flying across the road into the green belt. And uh, here's what it looked like, uh, the exit hole of the adult coming out of that little bonsai maple tree. And this is uh, the area right across from the nursery in Tuckwilla, Washington. This is what it looked like in 2001, about the time the beetles flew into the green belt. The bottom picture is what it looked like in late 2002 after we had to cut a lot of trees in a lot of people's yards. And it wasn't, as you might expect, a universally popular thing to do. But it was necessary to prevent a bigger problem. And it's hard to explain to people why you're having to cut trees to save trees. But sometimes that's what has to be done. And the, yes? Yeah, exactly right, Ray. And the good news is that uh, years of monitoring after the action was taken uh, yielded no further beetles. So we believe we were successful despite the fact that this cost a lot of money and it was not an easy thing to do. So anyway, because of these kinds of fines, USDA decided to make the requirements for bringing in this kind of material from foreign countries more difficult. So there's a lot of things that have to happen in the or country of origin before things like this can be brought in now. I should also mention that there's a lot of, you know, as you would expect, inspection of solid wood packing material for things coming in from ports also. And uh, I was just informed by one of my colleagues today that uh, uh, you know they found some interesting things in Portland just yesterday. So it continues, it's, it's not something that uh, goes away. I throw in regulated garbage just because that's, that's a pathway that I had not appreciated until a few years ago when they told me that I got to do regulated garbage in addition to other duties. Uh, regulated garbage, in short, is uh, you know everything from wrappers and uneaten meals on aircraft and ships coming in from foreign countries to the United States, with the exception of Canada. Canada is the only country from which garbage is not regulated. And the reason garbage is regulated is because of foreign animal diseases, but also the potential for plant pests and so on coming in with things that, if they were not disposed of properly, in this case, steam sterilization or incineration could, you know, if allowed to get loose, cause problems for agriculture and the general environment. A couple other examples of atypical pathways that I've run across. Once uh, years ago, we had a call from a, a blueberry farm. They'd gotten plans from Michigan. This was way late in the season. And they said, we've got these Japanese beetles climbing around once we open the boxes of blueberries. This, this would not have been expected at all. Again, it was late in the season, et cetera, et cetera. Things probably should have been, at a minimum, inspected in Michigan or otherwise. So, you know, these people ended up getting their backhoe out and digging a hole six feet deep and burying everything, which was the proper thing to do. Other examples that I've been involved with, when I worked in Hawaii many years ago, people had brought in a uh, snail from South America for the aquarium trade or possibly as an escargot snail. After they got tired of it, they decided to throw it in ponds and waterways, and you know some of which were farmed similar to rice. Thank you. And uh, it got away, of course, led to all kinds of problems. Uh, by the time I left Hawaii, it was still part of the fight, and I honestly don't know what came of it. But uh, again, these things happen that aren't always anticipated, and a lot of this can be prevented uh, either through just thinking about, gee, am I going to move something inadvertently? or uh, you know, just thinking ahead of time, let me do this so I don't move something inadvertently. And then the last example is a red imported fire ant. Uh, it's something that's been in the southern, southeastern United States for a long time. Uh, it's a pest that we would not want. We climatically have the potential to have it, not maybe quite as far north as here, but it has shown up in places like Oregon in the sides of railroad boxcars, cars. 
Uh, it can travel in what are called crane mats, which are big timbers that they move around and lay on the ground in order to roll the tracks of giant cranes for construction around. And a lot of this kind of equipment moves around, you know, without a lot of thought sometimes. But these kinds of pathways have been found to move things like red or imported fire ant. And again, a lot of them are things that, you know, nobody would even really think had the potential to move something. But again, it comes back to, you know, anything that moves can move invasive species. So anyway, that wraps it up. I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have and uh, appreciate your time and attention. I just was going to comment that the the uh, slide about the Cold War or the end of the Cold War in Russia, that's, is that also how the zebra mussels got into the Great Lakes was in ballast water uh, because of the trade that opened up? I'd be the wrong one to answer that. Oh. Does anybody else know? Because <laughs> I've, I've heard that. Is that true? You know? Yeah, it's the speculation. Anyway. Uh, how effective is, um, is fumigation of containers? Well, uh, fumigation occurs for a variety of reasons, either because it's something is found when inspection is done, or sometimes it's a condition of entry for products coming in. For example, the Customs and Border Protection people often find snails on the outside of shipping containers that have come in. And if they do, there are certain things that will lead up to a fumigation, if necessary, for the exterior of the container. Sometimes things that are in the containers, a good example is bamboo, for bamboo stakes for gardening and things like that. Again, because of the history of finding certain longhorn beetles and other pests in bamboo, a condition of entry for bringing in bamboo is the material has to be fumigated after it comes in. Now, my understanding, just in general, is that fumigation is considered effective. Um, you know, sometimes an actual fumigation treatment may have to be rerun just because of time or temperature considerations, uh, especially in, in climates like this and so on. But I think in general, it's uh, considered to be an effective treatment. So my understanding is that uh, uh, USDA, uh, the Japanese beetles are flying in, in in airplanes from, say, Memphis and places like that, and that the feds have sort of decreased their monitoring. Um, is that true, and is there anything that could be done to in reverse that? I'll do my best to answer that. Uh, Japanese beetle is a federal quarantine pest. It's true. Uh, again, mostly the area under quarantine is the eastern United States. And interestingly enough, the, um, the thing that's been what we call a regulated article, that is the, the item of concern that can bring Japanese beetle is in fact cargo aircraft. And so what happens back east is there's a lot of trapping done at airports. If they trap enough beetles in a certain amount of time, then the airport becomes regulated. And that means the planes that are leaving there have to either be inspected or uh, other means taken to prevent Japanese beetle from getting on board the airplane because uh, it's easy enough for a Japanese beetle to fly into an unprotected open door on the plane and be here on this side of the country in several hours time. Now, as far as the quarantine goes and the regulated articles go, I don't think any of that's changed. What I'm not as certain about is the extent to which uh, either the uh, trapping is done or other measures are done back east. What I do know out here is that, because uh, I've worked Japanese beetle in California and Oregon and Washington, and in those cases, the states at least traditionally have taken it upon themselves to inspect a uh, sometimes a rather large number of incoming flights from these regulated airports to see if any Japanese beetles either got missed and they're still on the plane alive, or if they're you know, dead due to a treatment that was done before the plane took off. And so uh, it's been a, a partnership that uh, to a large extent has been done by the states really through their own goodwill. Uh, and I do know that there's been, as has been the case over many years now, you know, some beetles found at uh, you know, major airports right outside 
uh, practically where the planes park and so on. Uh, fortunately, here in the state of Washington, that's the extent of what we have found is just, you know, every now and then some beetles found right at the airport. Uh, the real concern is uh, Portland, Oregon has a, an infestation that's been underway for a couple, three years now in Northwest Portland that's, uh, you know, very difficult to deal with. So we'll just have to see what happens. Uh, I think it's a great talk. Thanks, Glenn. Um, this is really basic information that the general public needs to hear, I think, because that's really the problem and the challenge is I would suspect 90% of the population has no clue this type of problem exists and the impacts that are there. So how do we get this type of education to that 90% of the people in the public? I think that's what we really need to work on. Yeah. Through curriculum or what have you. But Well, you're, you're right. It's a matter of spreading the word. And I know there's, through the Invasive Species Council and otherwise, there's been a lot of F emphasis on uh, educational aspects. And, you know, just myself, I can see where, you know, this kind of topic uh, provided as part of schooling at an early age could go a long way. I mean, nobody ever taught this to me when I was little, but if they had, it probably would have helped. Okay? All right. Thanks,